Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Appraisal Buzzcast. I'm Jim Morrison, and with me, as always, is our host, Hal Humphreys. Hey, Hal, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you, Jim? I'm doing great. Our guest today is Tobias Peter, the co-director of the Housing Center at American Enterprise Institute. And we're going to be talking about accessory dwelling units. Let me bring him in. Hey, Tobias, how are you? Hey, Jim, I'm good. How are you doing? Doing great. Tobias, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. We're always excited, excited when we get someone from the uh, Enterprise Institute to, to chat with us. You guys are, um, look, you guys kind of have that thousand foot view that a lot of times we miss. And I appreciate you taking the time. No, thank you for having me on, Hal. Um, well, let's do this, Tobias. For those in the room that are that are listening to the podcast or watching the podcast that don't know who you are, would you mind to give us a little bit of um, background on you know what your role is at the American Enterprise Institute and what your history in the industry is? Yeah, my, my pleasure. So yeah, I'm Tobias Peter. I'm the co-director of the AI Housing Center. Um, probably better known by my other co-director, Ed Pinto, um, who I think everyone in this in the industry knows quite well. Um, and yeah, Ed and I, we are pretty much attached at the hip. Um, I was fortunate enough to be taken under the wing by Ed and also Steve Olner, who was um, the co-director at the time. Um, back in 2015, um, they brought me along as a research um, analyst, um, worked my way up, um, had some great mentoring from Ed and Steve, as I said. And yeah, a couple of years ago became became a research fellow at AI and um, the research director at the Housing Center. And I think about a year ago was promoted to co-director of the Housing Center. So um, yeah, it's been it's been quite the ride. It's been fantastic I'm working with a very talented group of people here. And yeah, I'm always look, looking forward to speaking, speaking to the appraisal community because um, I get, you know, I, I don't have a background in appraisals, but I always learn a tremendous amount. So it's, it's very much appreciated. That's awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction. You know, I had the chance to speak with Ed on a, a Zoom call week before last about some appraisal history items. He is just a fountain of knowledge. Yes, it's oftentimes hard to keep up with him. <laughs> well, let's do this. Um, Tobias, let's take a real quick break and hear from one of our sponsors, and we'll come right back and get into the conversation. LIA Administrators and Insurance Services, serving valuation professionals since 1978. We provide ENO insurance with a commitment to superior customer service, outstanding liability education, and unmatched claim defense, benefiting over 10,000 real estate professionals nationwide. Explore our exclusive appraiser liability education by Peter Christensen and cost-effective seminars designed to foster your growth. Our underwriters, with an average of 26 years of experience each, are dedicated to supporting appraisers. Visit liability.com to discover how LIA can safeguard your business. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to the Appraisal Buzz podcast. I'm Hal Humphreys, your host, and I'm joined today by Tobias Peter. Tobias is with the American Enterprise Institute. You know, recently there have been some regulation changes around the country. I know Wisconsin uh, a few years back and now uh, Spokane and Washington State, uh, Spokane specifically, have made some changes about... Um, accessory dwelling units and density, trying to address some issues of um, affordable housing and, and density issues. What were the reasons behind these regulation changes and, and what do they mean? Yeah, excellent question, Hal. So basically we have a severe housing shortage in this country and depending on which study you believe, it's anywhere from three to eight, perhaps even 20 million housing units that we are short. And um, ultimately this is, in my opinion, this is not a market failure. This is really due to a government regulatory failure. And the reason is that various regulations from governments of all levels of, of you know, all levels of government have um, made um, have made buildable land scarce and building expensive. And this started in the 1920s when the federal government enacted um, zoning laws across the board. Um, or promoted these federal laws across the board that then get a, got enacted at the state and local level. Um, we also have um, discretion, the rise of discretionary reviews, the rise of the MIM, NIMBY movement, particularly in the 1950s, and then environmental laws and other regulations that have really made um, building very expensive. And because of those regulations, um, ultimately we have this, this housing shortage and we have just been not building enough housing. So now to address this, um, some states and localities have really put in place some thoughtful, um, thoughtful um, changes to their regulations that have made it easier to build additional housing. 
And this additional housing can come in many forms. I mean, what um, many many states have been doing is focus on transit oriented, so very high rise development. Um, versus others have taken a little bit of a different route because not every you know not every place is close to a transit area or even has a transit area. Um, so some of these places have looked more broadly and they have looked at what we call light touch density. Others call it the missing middle or gentle density, you know, you, you name it, whatever your preferred term. But um, what those um, what those um, laws have in common is that they are allowing a little bit more density on, a, on, on any given parcel. So instead of just allowing one single family detached home, you can go a little bit higher. So you can either build a duplex, a triplex, a quadruplex, you can build a series of townhomes, or in some instances, you can add an ADU. And um, when you do that and you make it by right and you make it across um, across a large swath of area, not just you know doing spot up zoning where you're just doing a little piece of town, of course, you know the owners of the land know, well, now my land is a lot more valuable. I can charge a higher price. So you want to do it across the board. You want to keep it short and simple. But um, if you do that right, um, you can actually have a big impact. And um, we have certainly a lot of case studies where we can show that if you do it right, um, you're going to get a massive supply response. That is a really interesting approach to, you know, and again, the terminology that people use is kind of across the board, middle, middle housing, you know, there are a number of names for this, this um, approach to addressing the issue. But one of the things that, that I have <clears throat> in thinking about this process, and, and, and I've, I've talked with several people about the Spokane issue, um, you know, one of the concerns that I had initially was, okay, so you, you increase the density, you allow a builder to build more units on a piece of property. Is there a chance we're going to run into like, instead of affordable housing for people newly getting into the market, do we end up with investor owned properties? that are just a series of quadruplexes that are all rental properties. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing with stuff like that? So, I mean, the beauty of this is that we actually have some case studies from around the country that go back 20, 25 years where this wasn't put in place a long time ago. And we have studied them. So we have studied in Seattle. We have looked at it in Houston. We have looked in Palisades Park, New Jersey. We've looked at it in Charlotte. There are many instances where they've actually done this 20, 30 or more years before. And we have a natural experiments um, that we can study. And um, when we looked at it, in particular in Seattle, where I've done a very deep dive on, on what happened there. So they've done in the 1990s, um, they set aside um, parts of the city for what they call low rise multifamily, you know, we call it light touch density, middle housing. And um, over the 20, 25 years that follow, they've built 18,000 townhome units. And it's been a smashing success. Um, been very popular with the people, um, especially because it has opened up home ownership opportunities for lower income, or I should say moderate income, those between 80 and 120% of area median income, younger demographics, and also more diverse group of people um, to get okay. on the first rung of the housing ladder. But it's really not been so much rentals. I mean, when we look at the data, it's been two thirds of these townhouses have actually been owner occupied. And of course, it's a little bit lower than in Seattle when you look at single family detached housing. Um, there you have about a homeownership rate of about 80%. So it's, it's lower than that, but it is much higher than um, the, the large multifamily apartments that have been built. So 20 or 50 plus units, the other homeownership rate is really only 9%. So, okay. um, and of course, if you are putting all your eggs in one basket and only focusing on transit high rise development over time, your homeownership rate in this country is going to decline um, just because right. you're adding more renters to the mix and you're not adding any new owner occupancies. But um, with light touch density, middle housing, you're actually balancing it out and you're adding a lot of owner occupancies and you can maintain or even increase your homeownership rate. I, that is such a good thing to hear from my perspective because it, it does two things. Number one, it addresses the issue of affordable housing for younger people trying to get into a market that is like, my neighborhood in Nashville, um, if my wife and I, and, and I'm not a young person just getting in the market, but even in our state of life, um, if we wanted to buy a house in Nashville, we could not afford to buy in our neighborhood. The prices have increased so much. Um, so it providing that, that middle, that light touch density range where younger people can get their first home and own it is amazing. But more importantly, for the appraisal perspective, one of the concerns that I hear across the board from appraisers and, and appraisal regulatory um, bodies is, well, you know, residential appraisers can't appraise a four, you know, a sixplex or whatever it is, 
But if you're telling me that you got, you know, basically 75% end up being owner occupied. So for instance, if you do a fourplex on a lot, number one, right now, a residential appraiser could appraise that project because it's one to four family for Fannie Mae loans. But number two, you go from one appraisal to four appraisals, which is genius for appraisers. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of good arguments to be made for this light touch density. And, you know, the appraisers are one of the groups that would benefit by having more business to do, but it's also the home builders. Home builders like building more housing, right? Realtors like selling more housing units. Um, the bankers like more, like making more mortgages. So um, you can draw in the entire business community. Um, you can also draw in the cities because from a city perspective, um, if you know you have a currently you have a parcel that is valued at about a million dollars because you have one structure, assume a developer comes in, tears down that that part, that structure on that parcel, and builds four units, each for a million dollars. So now your tax base your tax base has in fact increased from one million all the way to four million, um, while at the same time each unit is still selling selling for a million dollars each. Um, so that's you know kind of coming back to this affordability argument. This is actually great for affordability because not only do you maintain the same price level, but you're adding three additional housing units that three more families can now afford and buy into. And the flip side of the coin is always the McMansion. And if you don't allow this light touch density over time, you're going to end up with these old ramblers being torn down and being replaced with McMansions. And these McMansions, they then sell for $3 million, which is, of course, you know, a lot of money, especially for an entry level buyer. Um, and you're actually hurting affordability because someone who you know could afford a $1 million home, $3 million is completely out of their sight. So, um, um, so the incentives for this, the market incentives are really aligned. The market wants more housing, needs more housing. At the same time, the developers, you know, if they can sell four townhouses for a million, that's way better than um, a McMansion for three million. And from a city perspective, at the same time, you know, I can tax four million versus three million. So, um, the you know, kind of, if we just let the market um, do its thing and build more housing, um, the government just needs to get out of the way and loosen up these regulations and. The beauty of this is this is happening at the federal, at the state and local level. And, you know, we have a little bit of confusion here and there where everyone kind of has their, comes up with their own regulations, their own LL, some of them allow ADUs, others allow townhomes, you know, this and that. But um, we can study and we can learn from the best practices. And it's really the beauty of the laboratories of democracy at the state and local level. If the federal government, and that's really the danger that we see, if the federal government comes in and mandates a one size fits all solution, the chances are that they may not get it right. They may actually get it wrong and there, or there may be unintended consequences. And um, the progress that we're seeing in a lot of these places with California enacting a bill, you know, you mentioned Spokane, Washington, all of Washington did a, um, a light touch density bill, Oregon as well, um, Vermont, Vermont and Montana, um, you know, all that would be lost if the federal government um, came in with a one size fits all. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious about you know, so you mentioned nimbyism earlier on in the conversation and for, for the folks that say, well, I don't want that kind of density in my neighborhood, I think, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I think the market will probably figure those things out, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the NIMBYs don't like change and, right. um, but change is going to happen no matter what. And the change will come eventually through McMansionization and, you know, at the same time, and you know, there are certain there are certain ways of framing this to convince the NIMBYs, and especially what the argument that we found most useful in their survey that Cato, the Cato Institute has done a survey on this is if you frame it along the lines of well, where are your kids and grandkids gonna live, that really resonates with all the NIMBYs because they're realizing now, well, my kids they have to move across the country to be able to afford something, and I'm only gonna see them once or twice a year, and you know, the grandkids, you know, I don't, I'm never gonna see the grandkids ever. And those are all arguments that are pushing them in the direction of allowing at least moderately higher density in their neighborhoods. They don't want high rise development generally, uh, you know, because also with high rise, you're changing the neighborhood instantaneously. With this low rise, um, light touch density, ADUs, you know, you name it, the change is gradual and you can get used to it. Um, one high rise changes the neighborhood one second to the next. And, you know, that that's one argument. The McMansion and McMansionization is another argument, but then also, you know, property rights, right? I mean, that's fundamentally what's, what America is based on. Um, why are we allowing your neighbors, you know, a say over your own property? I mean, that's, that's fundamentally, you know, that's, that's 
fundamentally against the principle of property rights and individual ownership. Yeah, I hear you. Um, and that's one of those things that I personally struggle with. Um, our neighborhood in Nashville has a historic zoning overlay, which limits what people can and cannot do with their homes. Personally, I think it's great because I've got an older house. It's got some historic appeal. Um, but, you know, as, as a property owner, I, I kind of want to do what I want to do with my property. Yeah, um, yeah I and, totally get it. Yeah, I mean, the pendulum has swung a little bit too far in one direction where we, you know, kind of have swung too far in the NIMBY empowering the NIMBYs a little bit too much. I think we need to empower the market a little bit more to solve this acute housing shortage that we have. Okay, well, let's do this. Um, I want to take a real quick break and hear from one of our sponsors and we'll come right back and finish up the conversation. The Dictionary of Real Estate Appraisal, 7th edition, is a landmark text that reflects the depth and breadth of appraisal knowledge. Each entry, definition, and reference has been painstakingly researched and designed to reflect an expert understanding of issues that currently impact the profession. The new dictionary is an essential authoritative resource for all appraisers. The dictionary is divided into two sections, an alphabetical listing of terms directly related to real estate appraisal and an addendum with topical glossaries and compilations of terms used by related real estate professionals. Find it at appraisalinstitute.org slash dictionary seven. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to the Appraisal Buzz podcast. I'm Al Humphreys, and I've got Tobias Peter here with me today from the American Enterprise Institute. And I'm absolutely fascinated with the conversation, Tobias. Um, this is a topic that a lot of appraisers are talking about. There's some trepidation out there about what it means for us. You recently penned an article for The Hill uh, based on these new regulations, I think specifically relating to Seattle. Can you give us a rundown of that article? Tell me, tell us kind of what that is and, and tell people where to find it. Yeah, so it's on the Hill. If you just Google Tobias Peter, um, um, state and local solutions for 2024, um, you, you'll, you'll, you'll find it. But the, the, the gist of the article is really that it's a, the government has created a regulatory failure and that's why we're not building more housing it's not a market failure it's really a government regulatory failure and just to give you a little bit of analogy um and a somewhat simplified analogy here in housing um because we have made buildable land scarce and building expensive um, we're building a few very expensive housing units those are the mcmansions and there's nothing wrong with building mcmansions but for at the middle of the price spectrum we're building hardly anything um, because it's it's just not economical but to, to um, um, but then also we're building a few housing units for in quote affordable housing that's really expensive housing made affordable through subsidies but of course at some point we're running out of money and we cannot you know spend more money on affordable housing and um, the the counterpoint is look at the functioning market look at what's going on on the um, in the car market for example where in the car market we're also building a few very expensive cars um, those are you know the Ferraris for example they are fairly expensive not many people can afford them but we're still building them um, but at the same time we're building a lot of cars in the middle of the price spectrum so those are your Toyota Camrys you know some of your Chevys and your Fords those are nice cars um, but you know, selling for twenty five, thirty thousand dollars And, you know, we're building a ton of them because there's a ton of market for them. People just want new cars. And in its spectrum, there's a lot of car, a lot of people in that middle income spe spectrum that can afford these cars. But no one has the idea of mandating car manufacturers to build new cars for people earning, you know, 60% of area median income. It's just preposterous. Why? Well, because we're building a lot of new cars in the middle of the price spectrum, and then people buy these new cars, and then their older cars that have been on the roads for four or five years, they sell them. And those older cars filter down to um, lower income people until everyone, you know, who wants a car has a serviceable car. The same would happen in housing if we were to get, if the government were to get out of the way and were to allow the market to build again at the middle of the price spectrum, rather than just building the very expensive housing Ferraris that we're currently doing. And, you know, if government were to get it right and there's, you know, there's hope, um, there's wind at our backs, there's, you know, all these states and localities have passed recent reforms. And um, I think this would open up massive business opportunities for builders, you know, um, realtors, mortgage bankers and appraisers, because, you know, as I said before, a lot of these um, townhouses that they're being sold, they're actually sold to owners. And that means appraisals fundamentally. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love it. And Tobias, I got to say, I, I love a good analog as much as the next guy. And I love the way you walk through the analogy of the car market and the housing market. And I think you did a really good job with that. Thank you again, Tobias, for being here. I know you've got um, things you need to do in the not too distant future. But Jim Morrison, do we by chance have an anonymous appraiser question that we could have a look at here? Uh, we are looking for more anonymous appraiser questions. I know we're running at the end of Tobias's uh, time, so why don't we just finish on up, and then we can we can settle out the anonymous appraiser question for next week's episode. That sounds great. Do we have anything else we need to cover? No, Tobias. Thank you so much for your time, and and we'll put a link for the, your article on the Hill and attached to this article. Appreciate it, Jim and Hal. Yeah, thank, thank you. you in that case, since we have nothing else to discuss, we don't have an anonymous appraiser question for Jim Morrison and Tobias Peter. I'm Hal Humphreys, and that is your appraisal buzz for this week.